Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com. This is St. Louis on the Air from St. Louis Public Radio. I'm Elaine Cha. But have they told a story? And a story that anybody else would like to see. Their mediocre cover band from the yeah. 70s when they were in high school. Did he really wait 11 years specifically for that? <laughs> I'd like to think so. Okay. And I'm going to ask him at the screening. He'll say yes, and I hope he does. Okay. But, you know. <laughs> Cinema St. Louis has supported local filmmakers since 1992. Ten years later, the St. Louis Filmmaker Showcase, the first one ever, took place, screening films with St. Louis roots all around the STL area. Tonight kicks off the 23rd iteration of the series, which focuses expressly on films about St. Louis or by artists from St. Louis at their new permanent home, High Point Theater. Here to discuss this year's St. Louis Filmmaker Showcase is... Chris Clark, Artistic Director for Cinema St. Louis. Chris, thanks for coming back to the show. Good afternoon. It's fun to be here. So we're going to get to the films in a moment, but let's start with the basics. How did the St. Louis Filmmaker Showcase come to be in the first place? That is a great question because it was not us. Um, <clears throat> at, for the very first year, uh, there was an entity at that time called the St. Louis Film Office. There is a new entity of the same name under the auspices of the Convention Visitors Commission now, but it, it was separate. Mm -hmm. uh, so they knew they were going to be closing at the end of that year because of, of budget cuts. So they decided to do this big, lavish event, and they pulled together a bunch of films and filmmakers and had a big party at the pageant, and um, people loved it. <laughs> um, it was wildly curated. And there were things in programs that probably shouldn't be next to each other okay. um, artistically and audience-wise and <laughs> things that okay. didn't quite belong <laughs> and a little rough. Uh, and it was still the early days of what is now a very thriving film community because people were relegated primarily to working on film, which was very expensive. Mm. And only a certain few and well-funded could really do that right. effectively or at all or to make much. Well, now, you know, 20-something years later, the digital revolution has changed that. Anybody with a phone can make a film. Mm -hmm. But have they told a story? Yes. And a story that anybody else would like to see. And right. that's what we think we're doing here, is finding the best possible voices and visions uh, of local filmmakers. So the St. Louis Film had this big thing. Uh, then they closed. And then um, people involved with that, Kim Tucci was on our board, later was our board president, they talked about it down there. Didn't They didn't want this event to go away because right. they recognized some value there mm -hmm. and said, well, hey, you know, at that time, we were still called, the organizationally, we were called the St. Louis International Film Festival. This is a big history right, lesson today. Right. <laughs> well, I think it's, yeah. it provides a, some great context, context sure. yes. because in an international film festival and one that is focused mm -hmm. squarely on St. Louis, so they're Two different things. going to be different. So that, that's all we did at the time was the International Festival. But they said, hey, you know, you do film things, would you take this on? And we yes. immediately said, yes, yeah. uh, we did that. And yeah. it has grown over the years. And this year, you've got 17 um, pieces that you're showing. So let's talk about the featured films. And there are four full-length films that you are going to be showing, mm -hmm. and it includes narrative and documentary. So let's hear about what uh, what these films are about and what connects them to St. Louis. And the first one is The Box, which is a sci-fi film. It is a uh, sci-fi film. Aliens are among us through a, a magic portal that opens at a very specific time of day. Okay. And that's part of the story, too. Mm -hmm. But I, I love the connective tissue on this one because the director, David Linder, had his first narrative feature in the very first St. Louis Filmmaker oh, Showcase. Wow. Mm -hmm. And 23 years later, this film emerged. And, you know, another factoid about it, it, he actually shot most of it like 11 years ago. Oh, okay. And it sort of got shelved for a variety of reasons. Yeah. Uh, so, um, but it, it, it holds up well. It's a fun, interesting uh, 
yeah. piece. And uh, coincidentally, Eleven is something operative in the film, Yes, right? very yeah. oper- <laughs> extremely operative. So did he really wait 11 years specifically for that? I'd like to think so. <laughs> okay. And I'm going to ask him at the screening. He'll say yes, and I hope he does. Okay. But, you know. <laughs> now, there's a, a documentary film called Anthem, The Road to Redemption. Chris, what is this film about? It is about the love of rock and roll and what happened to these people. So uh, some college or high school students uh, in the late 70s uh, from Chaminade Dismet High Schools had a, in their own words, a mediocre cover band okay. called Anthem. Mm-hmm. And they, you know, they say to themselves, they weren't great, but they loved doing it. And they played around clubs and dances and things around town. And I was a rocker kid. I'm a little bit older than than they are. So, mm-hmm. but I, you know, I loved the school dances and the bands we would hire. Right, and they were all cover right. bands uh-huh. of rock and roll songs that we all enjoyed. So, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if I ever saw them or not. Maybe I did. Maybe I didn't. Okay. I, I don't remember them. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, but they remain friends, and their families are friends, and they have this community of not fans, but they just people that came to their concerts. They have this big. Group have that has stayed together all right. this time. A couple of years ago, they decided, hey, let's get the band back together again. They recorded an album and did a charity concert and, you know, brought the joy back to just playing live in front of an audience and, mm-hmm. and having a good time. And they did it. And uh, <clears throat> they just talk about that and, you know, the joy of being on stage, how much fun it was when they were kids. Um, so it's a party on film. Party on film. Right. Just, you know, it, it, <laughs> Yeah, it's celebratory right. of just the, the, the family and community that they created around their mediocre cover band from the yeah. 70s when they were in high school. Well, this is a nice segue to the next film I want to ask you about, and that is a musical, Somewhere in Old Missouri. What can folks expect from this particular film? This is a great program because it also includes three music videos um, along with the feature film, but somewhere in Old Missouri is it's, it's hard to describe. Uh, it's a black and white, black and white experimental uh, period piece set in Old Missouri with these uh, musicians. Uh, you know, evocative maybe of "Oh Brother, Where Art Thou?" They're kind of mm-hmm. on the lam a little bit and getting into crazy shenanigans along the way, and then then musical piece will come up <laughs> <Okay>. and <clears throat> uh, just sort of, sort of ramble along. There is a narrative arc. Uh, that flows through, but, yeah. you know, it other moves. things flow through too. So sure, it's just sure. a fun, you know, odd piece. Uh, and, an, you know, uh, 60 minutes is sort of an odd length for a film. It is mm-hmm. a feature length, yeah. but, you know, shorter than people are used to. Right, right. Uh, TV length, I guess. Okay. Um, but, you know, it's still fun. Yeah. And the rest of the, the shorts are great too. Mm-hmm. Now, there's a documentary um, that is about an original St. Louis dance. And this is something that I learned about in preparation for this conversation. Um, And it's a dance that has had a really big impact in hip hop. Tell us about Bring That Mono Back, that being D-A-T. I saw the director on a news interview yesterday dressed in an alien outfit okay. for some <laughs> unknown reason. So he, he, was, he was funny. He's a non-filmmaker. So he, he just wanted to tell this story because his is part of his past and his history and his love of dance and music and this club, which no longer exists. Um, so it, you know, dance sort of organically was moves were created in this club that is habituated by you know lots of people, including hip hop uh, musicians, which there are a lot of yeah. um, and have been from in St. Louis, uh, it caught on and these musicians and people who came to the club, well, it migrated to other places and it wound up in music videos and wound up in stage performers, wound up in concerts. And people would recognize, um, you know, we do have certain discrete styles here in St. Louis and that's yeah. one of them. They recognize the style of, the, of these moves mm-hmm. and it's, re- it's, it's kept up, you know, you, you see elements of it in music videos and in performances to this day. And so people it fondly like... remember it. So again, a love of dance, a love of music, and a celebratory look at, you know, part of our own cultural history. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, not about that building I see over there or something, yeah, you know, yeah. maybe more important, quote unquote, but, you know, cultural enrichment is important. Mm-hmm. And did you learn from this particular piece? Uh, I I tried a little bit and I promised I will get a 
brief lesson, but I'm super clumsy <laughs> and I cannot dance. So I didn't. I, I learned about this bit of history, but I didn't, you know, I'm not going to be a dancer. Okay. Uh, I, I would be sitting right next to you on that one. Now, you mentioned shorts earlier, and mm-hmm. along with the feature-length films, there is a wide variety of documentary shorts. They all have different vibes, you know, personalities, and personal connections. And one that caught uh, my attention was the documentary short Guardian. Can you share a little bit about that? I can. I could talk okay. all day. <laughs> uh, it is, it's a bunch of different things ultimately, um, but gar- the, the, the word guardians means that these two adult daughters, uh, their mother has had a serious accident a number uh, over a decade ago, and she is in a uh, facility where she lives, just navigating, taking care of her and making sure her needs are met other than because you know, even though someone else is doing it and... Uh, <clears throat> trying to keep the family together, but the, the, the glue there is, and no pun intended there, is um, the mother's horse, oh. which they have kept over time, and they ride her, and they just, you know, they're, as they're navigating the, um, the healthcare system yeah. in Missouri as part of the story and taking care of it, you know, the horse is what, you know, kind of keeps Carries them grounded <laughs> and, and links them to their past, and yeah. they show some, you know, old home movies of the three of them when they were little, girls mm-hmm. and the mom, you know, probably riding the horse in the stable. So they've, they've kept this uh, grooming and, and taking care of and loving this horse. And right. then, uh, you know, later on, it's not giving it away, but they, yeah. they take the mom to see her one time. It's just sure. a kind of a, and a sweet moment and, you know, something she doesn't get to do every day because mm-hmm. she's... She's unable to. Unable yeah, to. Yeah. yeah. We're talking with Chris Clark, who's Cinema St. Louis's artistic director, and we're discussing the 23rd iteration of the St. Louis Filmmakers Showcase. Uh, another documentary short that grabbed uh, my attention is Raising Spirits, the Big Muddy Dance Company, because the synopsis mentions that the film started out about one thing and then ended up <laughs> becoming something else. And that's something that we on the St. Louis on the Air team can relate to when it comes to producing this show. Tell us about Raising Spirits. Yeah, it's, that, that's the great hook of it. it. It would have been what his original intention was to document the creation of this dance piece. And that would have been a fine film. And we probably would have shown it. And then they would have shown a bit of the, you know, the performance in action. Everyone would have clapped and that would have been it. But <laughs> quarantine happened and COVID and the play was canceled. Mm-hmm. And they had done all this work getting it up and they had started this film. So they were kind of halfway there. So you have to be fluid and nimble. You know, as a documentarian, they're documenting what is going on. But life gets in the way. Yeah. Uh, things happen. Uh it just doesn't happen with most documentaries, but when you do, you have to be very nimble and be able to, and they did, they pivoted and made it just about doing the art just to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, is it, is it still theater if nobody's there? Well, sure it is. Yeah. And now it is preserved in a different way mm-hmm. and people can see it differently. Yeah. There's a documentary called Wheels of Thunder, Stories of Community and Courage. And this one is interesting given the span of time and the place it seems to cover. Talk to us about this one. These are some, uh, <clears throat> the, the main subject is, is a war veteran, uh, and he wants to honor the legacy of his fallen brothers, and his path was dirt bike racing in southern Missouri. Mm. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it seems odd to get one to the other, but that's, yeah. you know, where he lives, and he, you know, Gathers community there um, by this odd sport, mm-hmm. and, and just you know, shares time. But it makes sure he just wants to, you know, keep uh, memories alive um, by sharing his passion with others right, and, right. and gathering people together. And they do special events, and uh, yeah, it, it's, it's it's hard to put it all together. Yeah. Well, this is why you're telling us about it, sure. so people can go and <laughs> yes. enjoy them yes. right on the screen. There are also animated and experimental mm-hmm. shorts, um, many more films, and uh, there are two other film programs in the showcase. Can you give us a quick hit, sort of run through, of animated and experimental shorts, that program and the narrative shorts program overall? Uh, they're actually 
eight narrative short subject programs mm -hmm. overall and two documentary short term programs and then the separated the animated and experimental shorts. They always just sort of get lumped together. Uh, but uh, there are some world class uh, or experimental video and film creators mm -hmm. that live in St. Louis and two of them uh, are habitually in this event okay. because their work is great and uh, uh, Van McElwee and Zlatko Chosic. Um, they show their films literally all over the world. Mm. Uh, so they are internationally renowned for this film. And <clears throat> what experimental means, you know, it's hard for me to quantify exactly, too. Sure. It's just, <laughs> it, it's an, a non-narrative. Uh, there might be, you know, an arc of a story, but it's told, you know, in, in different ways. You're trying to get outside the box, not just, you know, people talking to each other, somebody mm -hmm. driving a car on the street, you know. <clears throat> What people will, would assume that, you know, flashes of colors and, and more kaleidoscopic type things. And, yeah. and sometimes that is part of it. But, uh, you know, the animation these days can mean many things. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, a great uh, stop motion piece uh, called Fortune Cookie that is just beautiful. About the sad little fortune cookie trying to <laughs> get his way through this field of monsters. <laughs> They're nibbling little bits of his head along okay. the way. <laughs> uh, but it's beautifully and artfully done. Uh, <clears throat> And then the things that are, there's several that are hand drawn and old fashioned like construction paper, uh, and you know, s s not not cell animation, but you know, take a couple clicks and move the little fish and yeah, stuff yeah. like that. That you know, it's very difficult to do because it's very time consuming. Mm -hmm. uh, there's almost 20, um, 18 wow. maybe pieces in this program. They're all short-ish, mm -hmm. um, you know, five minute, three to five minutes most yeah. of them. But uh, you know, cartoonish, um, poetic. Uh, you know, there's always nice musical scores going with them. So, you know, it's a very thoughtful uh, type program as well. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that there are a couple of people who are, who are returning filmmakers. Mm -hmm. Are there many of those? I mean, over the span of 23 years, I'd imagine that there are some, um, some folks who do come back year after year. Are there any that, you know, that stand out to you as being quite representative of how this showcase has developed over time? Uh, I, the, uh, the two gentlemen I just mentioned, Van and, and Zlatko, uh, they have been in almost every showcase uh, over time. Van is a former film instructor from Webster University, and Zlatko uh, you know, teaches somewhere in town. I don't remember. Uh, but, but works in exhibits, you know, in installations all over the world. So those are things like that. But the credits of the films, I always try to watch at the end because there's always a director of one film shows up as the grip or cinematographer of another film. And the, the you know, if you did those yarn lines, sure. uh, it, would, they, it would be nuts. It would be everywhere because yeah. there's always a cast of characters that sort of swap roles or the same cinematographer works again and again and again. You can tell, oh, uh, that style yeah, uh, yeah. you can recognize. And people meet each other. Um, you know, I don't feel responsible exactly, but I'm happy when I hear that people have met at the showcase. Hey, I liked your film. Hey, I liked your film. Yeah. They meet, they have beers at the party at the end, and then they work on a film the next year and they get submitted. I love when that happens. Yeah. Well, that sounds very St. Louis, too. Yes. In that, you know, people get to know one another. They do create these these bonds and then produce some really cool things. It's a very tight-knit community. People share their resources and their time. Uh, there have been some people and moments that, you know, aren't team players oh, and sure. <laughs> and that the people protect each other yeah, and let each other yeah. know. So they really, the, the St. Louis spirit comes in, they really fiercely protect each other and, you know, the vibe that they've yeah. created and the community they've created. Mm -hmm. Now, Chris, all these films are connected to St. Louis and, you know, seeing the showcase get bigger and bigger over the years must feel pretty gratifying and even more so now that Missouri has tax incentives back for film and television projects that are produced within the state. Um, the Show Mo Act <laughs> uh, is the name of that bill, it was part of Senate Bill 94, and it was just passed earlier this month by Governor Parson. Now, Missouri hasn't had something like this since 2013 when the last bill expired. And we've had some conversation on this show about what tax incentives can do. Why do you think, Chris, that everyone, whether you're a filmmaker or not, should be celebrating the passage of this bill? It's going to provide a lot of uh, 
positive look on Missouri. Like, you know, one one example is Ozark. The uh, the show is not filmed here <laughs> right. because there wasn't a tax credit. So it's filmed in Georgia, I think, uh-huh. uh, or Carolina. One of, the, Georgia, one of those. A, a different state that's not Missouri. Right, They're filming right. the show about, you know, this town and area in Missouri. So another lake is Lake Leozark. So, you know, that's not right. Yes. Uh, because there wasn't the, the tool to be able to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, the former credit was was, was much smaller. Mm-hmm. Um, it was about $10 million smaller. It was only about three and a half million okay. when that got axed um, back then. Uh, there were a lot of tax credits of just about every product and commodity and service in the world. There was too many. Um, mm-hmm. So there was a, a big pullback across yeah. the board. It wasn't specifically against the film. But it's hard to, you know, picture that, you know, when people... The assumption was that people would come into town, get the tax credit, and then go back to Hollywood. Yeah. Well, that's true, but that's not the whole story. Right. They've hired ideally local people um, to do and work as crews. It, it expands their experience range and the community. Then they can go off and make these films that we're showing in the showcase because they've made, earned a living uh, as a filmmaker. And yeah. then you'll get people that will see what Missouri looks like mm-hmm. uh, and you know see actors. And it's a it's a step stepping stone right. uh, ladder to mm-hmm. up to positive stuff. <laughs> and this this last question here because I saw that there are filmmaker master classes. Yes. Tell us briefly what that is because I think that plays into this, you know, about producing here um, in different ways. It's part of our cultural mission to to give back, you know, what we can when we can. Uh, and this is one example. We have a former board member who gave us a, a very generous grant a number of years ago. And this, and, and it's set out over time that we do these things at this event in the International Film Festival. Where they have these classes that speak to um, various topics in the filmmaking process. And usually there's three or four uh, in each event. They're free and open to the public. Mm-hmm. You don't have to be a filmmaker. Just be kind of interested in the topic. Sure. Uh, this year there are three. Uh, one is called Film Criticism and Flyover Country. Mm-hmm. We're in the middle of the country. We're not Chicago, which is kind of a stop, people think. Yeah. Um, but New York, L.A., we're, you know, stuck there. So, you know, what does it mean to be a film critic here? And, you know, why would they take, pay attention or not? Yeah. So that's an interesting topic. Uh, uh, the Missouri Film Commission mm-hmm. has a, uh, at the very end, has Missouri stories from their long-running script-writing competition where these winning scripts have been made into films and then there's a legal panel by those lawyer people okay. uh, in the middle. <laughs> well, Chris Clark is Cinema St. Louis's artistic director. Chris, thanks for coming back to the show. Thank you. The St. Louis Filmmakers Showcase kicks off tonight at High Point Theater. These films with a local connection are screening this weekend and next from July 28th through the 30th. Order your movie tickets at cinemastlouis.org. This episode was produced by Maya Norfleet. Audio engineering and podcast design by Aaron Doerr. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. St. Louis on the Air proudly supports local artists by using music from Life Creative Group. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thank you. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, providing more than 41,000 jobs in the production of wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details at ChooseWood.com.